Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, Chapter Twenty. Beloved, she my daughter, she mine. See, she come back to me of her own free will, and I don't have to explain a thing. I didn't have time to explain before because it had to be done quick, quick. She had to be safe, and I put her where she would be. But my love was tough, and she back now. I knew she would be. Paul D ran her off, so she had no choice but to come back to me in the flesh. I bet you, baby Suggs, on the other side helped. I will never let her go. I'll explain to her, even though I don't have to. Why did it? How if I hadn't killed her, she would have died, and that is something I could not bear to happen to her. When I explain it, she'll understand, because she understands everything already. I'll tend her as no mother ever tended a child, a daughter. Nobody will ever get my milk, no more except my own children. I never had to give it to nobody else, and the one time I did it was took from me. They held me down and took it, milk that belonged to my baby. Nan had to nurse white babies, and me too because Mam was in the rice. The little white babies got it first, and I got what was left, or none. There was no nursing milk to call my own. I know what it is to be without the milk that belongs to you, to have to fight and holler for it, and to have so little left. I'll tell beloved about that. She'll understand. She, my daughter, the one I managed to have milk for and to get it to her even after they stole it, after they handled me like I was the cow, no, the goat, back behind the stable because it was too nasty to stay in with the horses. But I wasn't too nasty to cook their food or take care of Mrs. Garner. I tended her like I would have tended my own mother if she needed me. If they had let her out the rice field because I was the one she didn't throw away, I couldn't have done more for that woman than I would my own ma'am if she was to take sick and need me, and I'd have stayed with her till she got well or died. And I would have stayed after that, except Nan snatched me back. Before I could check for the sign, it was her, all right. But for a long time, I didn't believe it. I looked everywhere for that hat. Stuttered after that. Didn't stop it till I saw Hallie. Oh, but that's all over now. I'm here. I lasted. And my girl come home. Now I can look at things again because she's here to see them too. After the shed, I stopped. Now in the morning. When I light the fire, I mean to look out the window to see what the sun is doing to the day. Does it hit the pump handle first or the spigot? See if the grass is gray green or brown or what. Now I know why Baby Sucks pondered color her last years. She never had time to see, let alone enjoy it before. Took her a long time to finish with blue, then yellow, then green. She was well into pink when she died. I don't believe she wanted to get to red, and I understand why because me and beloved outdid ourselves with it. Matter of fact, that and her pinkish headstone was the last color I recall. Now I'll be on the lookout. Think what spring will be for us. I'll plant carrots just so she can see them, and turnips. Have you ever seen one, baby? A prettier thing God never made. White and purple with a tender tail and a hard head. Feels good when you hold it in your hand and smells like the creek when it floods. Bitter but happy. We'll smell them together, beloved, beloved, because you mine and I have to show you these things and teach you what a mother should. Funny how you lose sight of some things and memory others. I never will forget that white girl's hands, Amy. But I forget the color of all that hair on her head. Eyes must have been gray though. Seem like I do remember that Mrs. Garner's was light brown. Well, she was well. Got dark when she took sick. A strong woman used to be, and when she talked off her head, she'd say it. I used to be strong as a mule. Jenny called me Jenny when she was babbling, and I can bear witness to that. Tall and strong, the two of us on a cord of wood was as good as two men. Hurt her like the devil not to be able to raise her head off the pillow. Still can't figure why she thought she needed school teacher though. I wonder if she lasted like I did. Last time I saw her, she couldn't do nothing but cry. 
and I couldn't do a thing for her, but wipe her face when I told her what they'd done to me. Somebody had to know it, hear it, somebody. Maybe she lasted. School teacher wouldn't treat her the way he treated me. First beating I took was the last. Nobody going to keep me from my children. Hadn't been for me taking care of her, maybe I would have known what happened. Maybe Hallie was trying to get to me. I stood by her bed, waiting for her to finish with that slop jar. When I got her back in the bed, she said she was cold, hot as blazes, and she wanted quilts. Said to shut the window. I told her no. She needed the cover. I needed the breeze. Long as those yellow curtains flapped, I was all right. Should have heeded her. Maybe what sounded like shots really was. Maybe I would have seen somebody or something. Maybe. Anyhow, I took my babies to the corn. Hallie or no? Jesus. When I heard that woman's rattle, she said, "Any more?" I told her I didn't know. She said, "I've been here all night. Can't wait." I tried to make her. She said, "Can't do it. Come on, who? Not a man around. Boys scared. You asleep on my back. Denver's sleep in my stomach. Felt like I was split in two." I told her to take you all. I had to go back in case she just looked at me. Said woman. Bit a piece of my tongue off when they opened my back. It was hanging by a th- shred. I didn't mean to. Clamped down on it. It come right off. I thought, Good God, I'm going to eat myself up. They dug a hole for my stomach so as not to hurt the baby. Denver don't like for me to talk about it. She hates anything about Sweet Home except how she was born. But you was there, and even if you too young to remember it. I can tell it to you. The grape arbor, you memory that? I ran so fast. Flies beat me to you. I would have known right away who you was when the sun blotted out your face the way it did when I took you to the grape arbor. I would have known at once when my water broke. The minute I saw you sitting on the stump, it broke. And when I did see your face, it had more than a hint of what you would look like after all these years. I would have known who you were right away because the cup after cup of water you drank proved and connected to the fact that you dribbled clear spit on my face the day I got to 124. I would have known right off. The Paul D distracted me. Otherwise, I would have seen my fingernail prints right there on your forehead for all the world to see. From when I held your head up out in the shed. And later on, when you asked me about the earrings I used to dangle for you to play with, I would have recognized you right off, except for Paul D. Seems to me he wanted you out from the beginning, but I wouldn't let him. What you think? And look how he ran when he found out about me and you in the shed. Too rough for him to listen to. Too thick, he said. My love was too thick. What he know about it? Who in the world is he willing to die for? Would he give his privates to a stranger in return for a carving? Some other way, he said. There must have been some other way. Let schoolteacher haul us away, I guess, to measure your behind before he tore it up. I have felt what it felt like, and nobody walking or stretched out is going to make you feel it too. Not you, not none of mine. And when I tell you you mine, I also mean I'm yours. I wouldn't draw breath without my children. I told Baby Suggs that, and she got down on her knees to beg God's pardon for me. Still, it's so. My plan was to take us all to the other side where my own mam is. They stopped me from getting us there, but they didn't stop you from getting here. Ha <laughs> ha! You come right on back like a good girl, like daughter. Which is what I wanted to be, and would have been if my mam had been able to get out of the rice lawn enough before they hand her and let me be one. You know what? She'd had the bit so many times she smiled. When she wasn't smiling, she smiled, and I never saw her own smile. I wonder what they was doing when they was caught running. You think? No, not that. Because she was my mam, and nobody's mam would run off and leave her daughter, would she? Would she now leave her in the yard with a one-armed woman, 
even if she hadn't been able to suckle the daughter for more than a week or two, and had to turn her over to another woman's tit that never had enough for all. They said it was the bit that made her smile when she didn't want to, like the Saturday girls working the slaughterhouse yard. When I came out of jail, I saw them playing. They came when the shift changed on Saturday, when the men got paid and worked behind the fences, back of the outhouse. Some worked stand, standing up, leaning on the tool house door. They gave some of their nickels and dimes to the foreman as they left. But by then, their smiles was over. Some of them drank liquor to keep from feeling what they felt. Some didn't drink a drop, just beat it on over to Phelps to pay for what their children needed, or their mommies, working a pig yard. That has got to be something for a woman to do. And I got close to it myself when I got out of jail and bought, so to speak, your name. But the Baldwins got me the cooking job at Sawyer's and left me able to smile on my own, like now when I think about you. But you know all that because you smart, like everybody said. Because when I got here, you was crawling already, trying to get up the stairs. Baby Suggs had them painted white so you could see your way to the top in the dark, where a lamplight didn't reach. Lord, you loved the stair steps. I got close. I got close to being a Saturday girl. I had already worked a stone mason's shop. A step to the slaughterhouse would have been a short one. When I put that headstone up, I wanted to lay in there with you, put your head on my shoulder, and keep you warm. And I would have if Bugler and Howard and Denver didn't need me, because my mind was homeless then. I couldn't lay down with you then. No matter how much I wanted to, I couldn't lay down nowhere in peace back then. Now I can, I can sleep like the drowned. Have mercy. She come back to me, my daughter, and she is mine. Beloved by Toni Morrison, audio by YQ, Chapter Twenty One. Beloved is my sister. I swallowed her blood right along with my mother's milk. The first thing I heard after not hearing anything was the sound of her crawling up the stairs. She was my secret company until Paul D came. He threw her out. Ever since I was little, she was my company, and she helped me wait for my daddy. Me and her waited for him. I love my mother, but I know she killed one of her own daughters. And tender as she is with me, I'm scared of her because of it. She missed killing my brothers, and they knew it. They told me die witch stories to show me the way to do it, if ever I needed to. Maybe it was getting that close to dying made them want to fight the war. That's what they told me they were going to do. I guess they rather be around killing men than killing women, and there sure is something in her that makes it all right to kill her own. All the time, I'm afraid the thing that happened that made it all right for my mother to kill my sister. Could happen again. I don't know what it is. I don't know who it is, but maybe there is something else terrible enough to make her do it again. I need to know what that thing might be, but I don't want to. Whatever it is, it comes from outside this house, outside the yard, and it can come right on in the yard if it wants to. So I never leave this house, and I watch over the yard, so it can't happen again, and my mother won't have to kill me too. Not since Miss Lady Jones House have I left 124 by myself. Never. The only other times, two times in all, I was with my mother. Once to see Grandma Baby put down next to Beloved. She's my sister. The other time, Pa D went too. And when we came back, I thought the house would still be empty from when he threw my sister's ghost out. But no. When I came back to 124, there she was. Beloved, waiting for me, tired from her long journey back, ready to be taken care of, ready for me to protect her. This time I have to keep my mother away from her. That's hard, but I have to. It's all on me. I've seen my mother in a dark place with scratching noises, a smell coming from her dress. I have been with her where something little watched us from the corners and touched. Sometimes they touched. I didn't remember it for a long time until Nelson Lord made me. 
I asked her if it was true, but couldn't hear what she said, and there was no point in going back to Lady Jones if you couldn't hear what anybody said. So quiet, made me have to read faces and learn how to figure out what people are thinking. So I didn't need to hear what they said. That's how calm me and beloved could play together, not talking, on the porch by the creek, in the secret house. It's all on me now, but she can count on me. I thought she was trying to kill her that day in the clearing, kill her back. But then she kissed her neck, and I have to warn her about that. Don't love her too much. Don't. Maybe it's still in her the thing that makes it all right to kill her children. I have to tell her. I have to protect her. She cut my head off every night. Bugler and Howard told me she would, and she did. Her pretty eyes looking at me, like I was a stranger. Not mean or anything, but like I was somebody she found and felt sorry for, like she didn't want to do it, but she had to, and it wasn't going to hurt. That it was just a thing grown-up people do, like pull a splinter out your hand, touch the corner of a tower in your eye if you get a cinder in it. She looked over at Bugler and Howard, see if they are right. Then she comes over to my side. I know she'll be good at it. Careful. That when she cuts it off, it'll be done right. It won't hurt. After she does it, I lie there for a minute with just my head. Then she carries it downstairs to braid my hair. I try not to cry, but it hurts so much to comb it. When she finishes the combing and starts the braiding, I get sleepy. I want to go to sleep, but I know if I do, I won't wake up. So I have to stay awake while she finishes my hair. Then I can sleep. The scary part is waiting for her to come in and do it, not when she does it, but when I wait for her too. Only place she can get to me in the night is Grandma Baby's room. The room we sleep in upstairs used to be where the help slept when white people lived there. They had a kitchen outside too, but Grandma Baby turned it into a woodshed and tool room when she moved in, and she boarded up the back door that led to it. Because she said she didn't want to make that journey no more, she built around it to make a storeroom. So if you want to get in 124, you have to come by her. Said she didn't care what folks said about her fixing a two-story house up like a cabin where you cook inside. She said they told her visitors with nice dresses won't want to sit in the same room with the cook stove, and the peelings and the grease and the smoke. She wouldn't pay them no mind. She said, "I was safe at night in there with her. All I could hear was me breathing. But sometimes in the day I couldn't tell whether it was me breathing or somebody next to me. I used to watch Hear Boy's stomach go in and out, in and out, to see if it matched mine, holding my breath to get off his rhythm, releasing it to get on, just to see whose it was. That sound like." When you blow soft in a bottle, only regular, regular. Am I making that sound? Is Howard? Who is? That was when everybody was quiet, and I couldn't hear anything they they said. I didn't care either because the quiet let me dream my daddy better. I always knew he was coming. Something was holding him up. He had a problem with the horse. The river flooded. The boat sank, and he had to make a new one. Sometimes it was a lynch mob or a windstorm. He was coming, and it was a secret. I spent all of my outside self loving Mom, so she wouldn't kill me. Loving her even when she braided my head at night. I never let her know my daddy was coming for me. Grandma Baby thought he was coming too. For a while she thought so. Then she stopped. I never did. Even when Bugler and Howler ran away, then Paul D came in here. I heard his voice downstairs and Mom laughing, so I thought it was him, my daddy. Nobody comes to this house anymore. But when I go downstairs, it was Paul D, and he didn't come for me. He wanted my mother. At first, then he wanted my sister too. But she got him out of here, and I'm so glad he's gone. Now it's just us, and I can protect her till my daddy gets here to help me watch out for Mom and anything come in the yard. My daddy do anything for runny fried eggs, dip his bread in it. Grandma used to tell me his things. She said any time she could make him a plate of soft fried eggs was Christmas. Made him so happy. 
She said she was always a little scared of my daddy. He was too good. She said, from the beginning. She said he was too good for the world. Scared her. She thought he'll never make it through nothing. White people must have thought so too because they never got split up. So she got the chance to know him, look after him, and he scared her the way he loved things, animals and tools and crops and the alphabet. He could count on paper. The boss taught him, offered to teach the other boys, but only my daddy wanted it. She said the other boys said no. One of them, with a number for a name, said it would change his mind, make him forget things he shouldn't, and memorize things he shouldn't, and he didn't want his mind messed up. But my daddy said, if you can't count, they can cheat you. If you can't read, they can beat you. They thought that was funny. Grandma said she didn't know, but it was because my daddy could count on paper and figure that he bought her away from there. And she said, she always wished she could read the Bible like real preachers. So it was good for me to learn how, and I did until it got quiet, and all I could hear was my own breathing, and one other who knocked over the milk jug while I was sitting on the table. Nobody near it. Ma'am whipped Bugler, but he didn't touch it. Then it messed up all the iron clothes and put its hand in the cake. Looked like I was the only one who knew right away who it was. Just like when she came back, I knew who she was too. Not right away, but soon as she spelled her name, not her given name, but the one Mam paid the stone cutter for, I knew. And when she wondered about Mam's earrings, something I didn't know about, well, that just made the cheese more binding. My sister come to help me wait for my daddy. My daddy was an angel man. He could look at you and tell where you hurt, and he could fix it too. He made a hanging thing for Grandma Baby, so she could pull herself up from the floor when she woke up in the morning, and he made a step so when she stood up she was at level. Grandma said she was always afraid a white man would knock her down in front of her children. She behaved and did everything right in front of her children because she didn't want them to see her knocked down. She said it made children crazy to see that. At Sweet Home, nobody did or said they would. So my daddy never saw it there and never went crazy. And even now, I bet he's trying to get here. If Paul D could do it, my daddy could too. Angel man, we should all be together. Me, him, and beloved. Mom could stay or go off with Paul D if she wanted to, unless Daddy wanted her himself. But I don't think he would now, since she let Paul D in her bed. Grandma Baby said people looked down on her because she had eight children with different men. Colored people and white people both looked down on her for that. Slaves not supposed to have pleasurable feelings on their own. Their bodies not supposed to be like that. But they have to have as many children as they can to please whoever owned them. Still, they were not supposed to have pleasure deep down. She said for me not to listen to all that. That I should always listen to my body and love it. The secret house. When she died, I went there. Mam wouldn't let me go outside in the yard and eat with the others. We stayed inside. That hurt. I know Grandma Baby would have liked the party and the people who came to it because she got low not seeing anybody or going anywhere, just grieving and thinking about colors and how she made a mistake. That what she thought about what the heart and the body could do was wrong. The white people came anyway. In her yard, she had done everything right, and they came in her yard anyway. And she didn't know what to think. All she had left was her heart, and they busted it. So even the war couldn't rouse her. She told me all my daddy's things, how hard he worked to buy her. After the cake was ruined and the ironed clothes all messed up. And after I heard my sister crawling up the stairs to get back to her bed, she told me my things too, that I was charmed, my birth was, and I got saved all the time, and that I shouldn't be afraid of the ghost. It wouldn't harm me because I tasted its blood when Mam nursed me. She said the ghost was after Mom and her too for not doing anything to stop it, but it would never hurt me. 
I just had to watch out for it because it was a greedy ghost and needed a lot of love, which was only natural considering. And I do love her. I do. She played with me and always came to be with me whenever I needed her. She's mine, beloved. She's mine.